Welcome, welcome, welcome to 239 of Center to Think Southwest Florida and beyond. And we are here with a really great guest. I mean, this is like an honor to be here. It's it's amazing that we have him. His name is Lou Merletti, and Lou is the former director of the Secret Service. Now, to have the former director of the Secret Service in my presence is amazing. He happens to be a good friend. We we met a couple two or three months ago. Yep. And I'll tell you, Lou is is one of us. He's law enforcement. He just he's an amazing man, and his story is incredible. Lou, welcome to the studio. What do you think about this? Uh, it's an honor to be here, Tim. It, it truly is. I'm I'm just thrilled. Yeah, believe it or not, we have Lou. Now you're you've been in Naples for how long, Lou? Well, I bought in 2013, and I moved here full time 2016. Wow. So you, yeah, you see, so you're you're pretty much you've been around. And I love it here. This yeah. is it. You'll know no. wild horses won't get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Now, why Naples? Well, actually, my wife, uh, she used to come here as, as a child with her parents. So she was pretty familiar with it. And one day she said to me, let's, uh, let's go down there. I want to show it to you. I was here maybe, I don't know, two days. I said, we're buying a house here. This is where we're going to live. This is it. This is great. And I will tell you that Lou is the most humble guy I know. He, he came... Uh, about two or three weeks ago and he's like listen tim he goes i really before you do the podcast i need to show you some things right so um lou ran me through his presentation and and i can tell you lou i, I had chills the whole time it was amazing to see this presentation and what you have done for our country and you know we're going to go back and we're going to start right at the very beginning and how you have served in the army as a, as a green beret and worked your way up to the last day of your, of your career. And still today you you've got that honor. You, we just had a discussion of you um, to West point this past weekend yeah. to, to help out. Tell me a little bit, Lou of, you know, kind of like how and what inspired you to, you know, maybe to, to get involved mm -hmm. eventually in the secret service, but a, a little bit in the military and your, in your family life. Yeah. Let me begin by saying this. Like I truly, I have witnessed some amazing moments and, and I have some wonderful memories of my career, but really it was the people that I was with the, the, my fellow green berets and my fellow secret service agents that, that really are the thing that I'll always remember. I mean, they, they really, you know, they were well-trained, but they did their missions because they had faith in each other and that I had faith in them. And so that, that, I just want to say that it really is about them. Now, how I got interested in the Secret Service, I was a sophomore in high school and uh, on November 22nd, 1963, and I was in a study hall. And at one point, a teacher came in and said, uh, we're going to turn the public address system on. And the, the principal came on, and then they flipped to the radio and they said, there's been a shooting in Dallas, uh, the president's been shot. He's taken the Parkland Hospital. And, of course, me and everyone else, I mean, the entire country, we were sitting on our chair, the edge of our chairs, wondering what is going on there. And I, I just kept thinking, the people that know, every, it's the Secret Service agents. They know what's going on. And that was my first real drive to me that, you know, I want to become a Secret Service agent. Now, interestingly enough, I mean, several things come in, in play here. One, I did feel if that's my goal, I have to test myself. And so I was a sophomore. So when I graduated, I, went, I enlisted in the Army and I selected uh, Airborne Infantry, the paratroopers. And I've, the Vietnam War was, was raging at that point. We were losing 300 to 400 soldiers a week. And I felt, you know, my... My fellow, my, the, the sons of America, they're out there fighting this war and I just can't go to college. I can't avoid all this. I, and especially if I want to become a secret service agent, I have to go do my part and I got to test myself to see if in fact I could withstand this, these, the, the pressures of war. And so um, I, that is what I did. Um, I enlisted, I went in and went through basic training uh, advanced infantry training and the jump school. And while I was at jump school, a green beret came to talk to our class. Now there had to be about, 
I don't know, 300 of us in the class. And he gets up on a, a, a physical fitness platform and he said to us, gentlemen, the special forces, we're losing a lot of men and we need volunteers. If you pass a test that's close to a college SAT and you finish jump school, you know, and you volunteer, we'll take you, we'll train you like no other. And then, you know, you'll go to Vietnam, but you'll be well, very well trained. You raised your hand. I raised my hand. So I took the test. I passed, finished jump school. I made my five jumps, got my jump wings and went right to Fort Bragg and began. For me, it was about a 16 month long journey. And it was a, it was a real test of one's will, your fortitude, your character. It was, it was tough. I mean, it, it hurt. It physically hurt. And it was mental, mentally very challenging. Did you at any time during that training, and we, we had this discussion when you came in and did the presentation, at any time did you say, I'm not doing it? And, and <laughs> I mean, it, it, just like, I, this, this is but what, what, obviously, your intestinal fortitude, right, yeah. drove you yeah. through. Yeah, it was, it was really a test of your fortitude. It truly was. I mean, there were, I mean, a number of times I thought that this, this is crazy, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop. But, you know, also, you end up having friends that you develop there. Absolutely. And you don't want to let them down. You don't want to let your family down. They're all following you. So it, it, it just it was like, no, I'm going to do it. I want to earn that green beret. So I hung in and you know, I, like I say, 16 months later, I graduated, got my beret. And uh, then I went to Vietnamese language school, which was another okay. challenge. I had a tough time in high school with Spanish. I thought, how is this going to work? But I, I, I got through that. You wanted it. I wanted it. And, and really, it was like an immersion course where there were only six of us to a class taught by a, a, a North Vietnamese woman. And within two weeks, we weren't even speaking English in the class anymore. It was all Vietnamese. You, you had so, to make that adjustments yeah, and change. Yeah. What was it, real, real quick, when you got that Green Beret and you stood there and, you know, basically – after you completed this, what was that feeling like? It, it, total pride and not only pride in me, but pride in all of my classmates. We had done it, you know, and we really did it together. I mean, we, we helped each other and all, but um, you do have a little bit of this, you know, I'm invincible now, you know, which is <laughs> right. not a real good thing to have, right. but, but you do have the idea that I could, I can do when I'm challenged, I can come through. I can do it. Yeah. So. Yeah, not, and not all people are even close to that. So, yeah. to, and I think, like you said, when you're in with a group of people, and I've been through several been challenges there. in my life, and I think with your, if you're doing it with the right people and you have the right goal in mind, that you, that's what gets you through. You're absolutely yeah, right, Tim. Absolutely. It's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing. No matter what branch of service you're in, you develop friendships, and those pull you, pull you through, push you through, you know, help you along. And then even the the time that you shared, uh, like with, with me in law enforcement and everything, th those having those friends right there, you never want to let them down. You do, you don't want to let anyone down. Yeah, absolutely. So now tell me a little bit about after you graduated and you became a Green Beret, duties, assignments, yeah. things like that. So after I finished Vietnamese language school, um, I I then was in the seventh Special Forces group, and with as soon as I was uh, actually prior to the Vietnamese language school, I volunteered to go to Vietnam. And um, so my paperwork went up to the Pentagon and I was waiting and waiting. And, you know, I was, I guess I was 21 at the time, a bit impatient. I want those orders. <laughs> they, I didn't see them coming. So there was a, a week, a three day weekend. And I decided, okay, I'm going to, I put my dress uniform on. I got a ride out to I-95 right outside of Fort Bragg, stuck my thumb out and a car within, I mean, within two minutes, a, a Volkswagen bug pulls over and a, and a guy, you know, opens the door and I got in the car and he looked at me because the uniform is very unique. Right. And he says, what are you? And I said, I'm, I'm special forces. He goes, you're a green beret because <laughs> because the, the song was out then right, right. And, and the movie with john wayne movie was out and everything i said i am and he said where are you going i said i'm going to the pentagon and he said to do what and i said i'm i'm, I'm making sure that my orders are, have been cut for me to go to vietnam wow 
And I said, where are you going? And he was going some further north, like New York. I, I think he was going to New York. And he said, that's where I'm going. But if that's what you're doing, I'll take you right to the Pentagon. And he did. He took me right to the parking lot of the Pentagon. I walked in and um, I got like a, there was a, an information desk. And I told him I'm special forces. I want to see the, the people in charge of our orders was, was um, a woman by the name of Billy. I don't know if I can remember her last name right now, but, but I, you know, I asked for her. They gave me this little diagram. I followed the diagram and went to her office, walked in and I said, I'm Sergeant Merletti. And I volunteered, you know, about a month ago, six weeks ago, I, I want to go to Vietnam. Where are my orders? And she, there was a stack of, of, folders on her on her desk and she went through them she goes here it is right here she no said, I'm kidding oh yeah she said you'll be there you'll be there in august so i said thank you and turned around walked out crossed the highway went to the airport flew home to visit my my uh parents in, in pittsburgh so that's how that's an unbelievable story i mean you're like that impatient I, like, I, i'm ready to, I'm, i went to this training i'm ready to go i'm ready i'm ready, I'm to, ready go. to go yeah yeah and then you, did you go in August? In fact, then, so I left and I mean, truly now, you know, after all this training, you still have not been in combat, real combat, you know, we've been in training. So the question is, wh what am I going to do when I get, what, where am I going to be assigned? It's a, it's a big question. So, um, when you arrive there, um, the training never ends, by the way, they, they take you off of, of the, uh, coast of Vietnam to a, a small island called Han Tre, and they have special forces set up a training center there. And um, we went through in my recollection, I'd say was maybe five days, six days of refresher training. So we, um, they got us up real early every morning. We had a backpack with a sandbag in our back and we had to run with that. They were like, they told us, they said, we know what you guys have been doing for 30 days. Now we're going to get you back into shape. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Last 30 days, been, you've been, been, been sandbagging. Yeah, that's, yeah. right, that's right. <laughs> so now you're going to pay. So we, we did all the running. Then um, we would, you know, zero our M16s. You know, then we would throw hand grenades, uh, set off Claymore mines, uh, light anti-rockets, like were they law rockets. Um, so it was a real just refresher course on everything. Then we went back to uh, Special Forces headquarters in the Trang, and there they gave us our orders, and I was sent to an A team. And um, uh, I mean, there are different types of assignments in Special Forces, and, and on an A team, um, that that's kind of like the backbone of what the secret. Of, I'm sorry, what the Special Forces does. So, um, and in the A team, I was assigned to. I was really lucky i mean i was with a great bunch of guys and a number of them that were like me i mean there were only 12 of us some of them had this was their first assignment to vietnam as i was but others they had been there and they had had multiple assignments multiple assignments. and those guys those veterans they they were leaders and i mean leadership matters and they took us under their wing and basically they told us we will teach you you know all that training it's good. Don't forget it. But now we're going to show you how not to get killed in the first time wow. you go out. So uh, they, they cared about us. And I mean, I, I would like to mention if I could two of their names, Yeah. because really without them, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. Uh, and one was uh, our, our team sergeant whose name was Tom Kemmer. And um, he ended up getting the distinguished service cross, which is one below the medal of honor. And then the other one I want to mention is, um, uh, his his real name was Frank Miller. Uh, his nickname was Doug, Doug Miller. And Doug, uh, he got the Medal of Honor. And I mean, but they were, they they taught you. Like when you were going to go out, it wasn't just go, get going, kid, and hope you come back. You know? Because when we did these operations, typically we only went out when there were two Americans. That was it. You and another Green Beret from your team. And then there would be a group of mercenaries and they were, could either be Vietnamese, Cambodian, mountain yards, or a combination of all those. Um, so there were some Chinese nuns. And so we would take them out with us, two Americans. And depending on the, the mission, the operation, we could have anywhere from maybe five or seven mercenaries with us, or you could have up to 30 of them with you. So, and, and this is the part that gets me. 
I was the only person on the whole team that spoke Vietnamese. Wow. So when these guys were going out with these people, now they did have an interpreter, but you're at the mercy of an interpreter then. Right. I mean, you, and, you don't know what's being yeah, conveyed. No. And, and the interpreters were all, they were not American. So they were, they were foreign. So, um, you know, for me to have the ability to speak the language and, and on, on occasion, I would be with a group that didn't know I could speak Vietnamese and I wouldn't say anything. I would just, just listen. listen. What, what are they saying? What are they doing? And I caught him a couple of times. Like, you know, I'd say to my buddy, hey, that guy's no good, man. I mean, he's saying things. This is not what he's, this guy's, he wants to get us hurt. Yeah. And I mean, when we would get back, of course, we would get out once we find these guys in our group. And um, we go to our team sergeant and tell him, hey, this is what happened out there. This guy's, no, this is a traitor here. And that was yeah, I was gonna. I was, that, that's an interesting concept too, as far as like, you know, who's the enemy, right? Or who's with you? Who's not exactly. with you? Anytime you you have that language barrier, exactly. But ingenious to put you through the school to be able to detect and pick up that stuff mm -hmm. because if you like you mm -hmm. said, there's two Americans and with this team, you don't know what you're getting into. You don't know, and you don't yeah. know who's you know, who's who's yeah. what side. So yeah, so you you went over there. You you were in Vietnam. What what's like a a, a uh, what was a there's no such thing as a normal day in vietnam but what what kind of run me through a okay a, a day a week okay. I, let's say a, a week okay right. so i was cross trained as i was an interpreter i was a medic and a light and light weapons so um if i was not on an operation then i would just get up in the morning you know have breakfast like a normal person yeah. and then i would go over to the dispensary and we would hold sick call for number one, any of the other Americans on the team that weren't feeling well. And that, that wasn't, they weren't there, you know, they didn't get sick often. But the mercenaries, part of the draw to get the mercenaries to come in with us, we allowed them to bring their families with them. Yeah. So, you know, the, it was a, the program was called CIDG, Civilian Irregular Defense Group. Now, I didn't even realize some of this stuff when I was there, but CIDG that was sponsored by the CIA. So they were paying these, these mercenaries to fight with us. So th the pay was, I'd say maybe three, four times the amount if they had been drafted into the Vietnamese army. Okay. So number one, the pay is good. Right. Number two, they could bring their families. Now, granted we were out in the middle of nowhere, but they had their families there. I mean, and their children included. Oh. And, you know, in the camp, like we were in the center of the camp and then on the outskirts, like the camp was not big. Okay. On the outskirts were, was like a little village. Okay. Well, I, I shouldn't say a village. It was in the camp and it was huts where they lived, but we provided them with food, you know, water and medical care. And that was, you know, psychologically, that was part of the thing. Like they knew hey, these Americans are taking care of us. They're paying us, you know, giving us food. And, and medical medical attention. So now that's what I would do if I was not on an operation. So, but I'd, I'd have to check the duty board and our team sergeant would post your name and it would say like tomorrow, Merletti and uh, Doug Miller, you're going out on a, an operation. You'll be gone for seven or 10 days, you know, go draw all your supplies. And, you know, you're going to be with this, you know, like, the the five five two company, which was in Vietnamese, Num Num High. Mm. You'd be with Num Num High, this group. And so then the next you know, we get up prepared, get into our um, tiger uniforms and everything. And um, next morning get down to the landing zone where right outside our camp. And we'd be inserted into you know uh, an LZ somewhere. And sometimes they were what we called cold LZs where you could go in and no one was shooting at you, or it could be a hot LZ hot, where yeah. They're, they're firing at you as you're coming in. And we, you know, get out of the choppers as fast as you can. And choppers would take off. And all of a sudden, it's like dead quiet. And you're listening to hear is anything coming at us. or And then you'd start off on whatever the, the uh, objective of that operation was. So, so there you'd be gone for, like I say, seven or ten days. Then you'd come back. But then, in addition to the operations you would have, if you were going to be back, say you're going to be back now for, from an operation for the next five or six days, you would have to pull overnight ambushes. So every like two days. So in the morning I'd be doing medical call 
Then at night, I get back into my Tiger fatigues, get all my, you know, M16, all the ammo, the grenades, the claymores. And I would, me and another American would take out a, a squad or so and go to a designated point that our team sergeant, he would tell us we have intelligence on this. Well, that was another thing. I never thought to ask, like, where's the intelligence from? I thought, like, our team sergeant was getting into it. I didn't know. I was just, I was following you my. Do what you're supposed to do. Do what you're told. Soldier. That's, that's, right. Yeah. that's right. No Merletti, questions. There you go. <laughs> do it. This is you. Do it. <laughs> I learned years later, it, that was also the CIA. So they were paying for the, for all the mercenaries and they were developing intelligence. They had a network of operatives in the area. So then we go out on an overnight ambush and quite uh, surprisingly, quite often the intelligence was good and we'd make contact with, I mean, typically it was either North Vietnamese NVA or Viet Cong and um, they'd walk into the ambush and yeah, all okay. hell would break loose. Give me a feel and a sense, a sense of feel of, you know, obviously this prepared you for your future in the secret service. And you talked about it um, with me you've been able to detect and you had that, that sense of yeah. surroundings. I mean, tell me what it's like to be in an ambush situation and just total chaos. I mean, what that's what, I mean, we, we can't comprehend it. Yeah. Uh, you know, l let me go back to my first ambush. Okay. So it, um, they tell me you're going out tonight. This is your first ambush. And I'd only been there maybe I don't know, two days at the most. So the guy I was going on with, his name was uh, John DeShaw. He was a sergeant. I was a sergeant. Of course, he had experience. I didn't. Right. So it was like, whatever you Sarge, say, Sarge. Whatever, you, yeah, whatever you tell me to do, John. So, and that's what he told me. He said, listen, okay, you've been through all the training. Don't forget the training. He said, but you don't, you stay right next to me and you do what I tell you to do. I said, no problem, John. You know, like whatever you whatever. say. So we go out and we set up and still to this day, I, I don't understand exactly how this went down. But at one point, and I'd say we set up the ambush. We were kind of up on a like a, a, a some elevated ground, a little ridge line. So we had the high ground, and there was a, a trail that that's what the intelligence said that there's a trail down there, and this is where the North Vietnamese are going to come down. So um, I, I guess it was maybe I think we had set it up right at dark. We set up, and. Um, I'd say it was, that was maybe around eight o'clock, maybe around 11 o'clock. I mean, it's pitch dark, you know, yeah. there's no, like you're not watching TV or yeah. anything. You're yeah. like sitting there yeah. listening and listening to all the, you Every know, noise. The, the little, little noises out there, you know, then, um, John Deshaw says to me, he like leans over and he goes, we have some work for you. And I was like, <laughs> the hell do you mean work for me? And he, he, so he's whispering and he says, one of the guys down the line, got bit by a snake and he said it's what we called a two-stepper which is i knew it was a very venomous snake and he said this guy is a senior mercenary and our team they don't want him to die we gotta save him. we gotta save him so now i'm like oh man like i'm i'm a, I'm a cross trained as a medic I want to do good because I don't want, if this guy dies, I, we go back the next morning, they're going to go, what kind of medic is this? Yeah, they, tell me how to, they tell me how to brace an arm. <laughs> yeah, <I'm sorry. laughs> I don't know. I mean, so here's my first challenge. All right. So they bring the guy up to me. And of course we have to maintain light discipline. So, you, so we, we take a poncho liner, take it, lay it on the ground. I crawl under it, pull the guy with me under it. And I had a flashlight. It was a red filter on the flashlight. I turn it on. I look at the guy's hand and hit, like I looked at his right hand and then I looked at his left hand. I, I think it was his left hand that had been bitten. It was like three times the size already of the right hand. It was like, oh my God, it was like a basketball. So I, I, I grabbed his belt and I put a tourniquet up above, up by his bicep to try to stop the venom from going further into his system. And then I, you know, I, I was a medic, but we were combat soldiers first. Okay? Right. So, right. but, and I, and I had learned from the other medic that was there, this is what you take out tonight. So he did tell me, um, I mean, I had, I knew somewhere in my little bag, it was a really small, this was not a big bag. It was a tiny little thing that I had in my backpack. I knew I had a scalpel in there somewhere. So I started looking through there real quick. I couldn't find it. It was just, 
I, I just could not find it. The light wasn't right. I couldn't find a thing. So I knew I got to cut this thing open and try to suck some of this out. But I had a buck knife that was right on my hip. So I took my buck knife and I just told the guy, like I said, you bite know, your teeth. You bite your teeth together. Do not make a sound out here. I mean, you scream, we're all dead. So I cut his, you know, his thumb open because it was on the thumb where he was, where the the, the uh, fang marks were, and I tried to suck some of it, but it was so swollen, very very little came out at all. So then I detected, and see, I'll tell you, special forces medic, their training, <clears throat> excuse me, their training is very thorough. Right. So we knew. Um, we knew the pathology of how venom acts in the body and it releases the way I recall this now, it releases a uh, histamine in your body. And then the histamine is what kills you. Okay. It, it, you know, like when you get a cold, like there's histamine being released in your body. So you go to the drugstore and you buy an antihistamine. Okay. Right. So my mind is going like, I, I got to, you know, first of all, I, I, asked John, can we get a medevac? And he said, I don't know if they'll come out here. I mean, we're in a bad area. I don't know. He said, but maybe they will because of this guy's seniority. So I said, well, you get on a radio, you work that. I'm, I'll keep doing this. So then I remember the senior medic told me that when you go out on these ambushes, always take like a small bottle of cough medicine because some of the guys will, will legitimately have a cough and then others are VC sympathizers and they begin to cough to let the enemy know where you are. So he said, you, you take this medicine out there. If they start coughing, give them this. If they continue to cough, you got a traitor on your hands. So I had a little bottle of cough medicine. And then he also told me, take out, there was a, if you remember years ago, there was a, an antihistamine called um, Contact, C-O-N-T-A-C. You could buy it at the drugstore. Well, the army had their version of contact. Their name was Ornade. So he also told me, take this bottle of Ornade. Now, it wasn't a big bottle, but I had at least like 20 Ornade with me. So I'm thinking of antihistamine. I got to get antihistamine into this guy's body. So I took my canteen. I told the guy, start eating these Ornades. So he, he, I had him eat 20. Holy. And so he's, you know, taking them in. And see, I could speak with him because I was speaking Vietnamese. That's and that was a good thing. So then John DeShaw comes in and he goes, they're sending in a medevac. So, um, uh, you know, we saved his life. A couple of minutes later, yeah, we, you know, we went on to this, we found an LZ, put out a strobe light. They came in, got the guy on board. And next thing you know, you know, we're back in the middle of the dark and it's dead silence. So now we got to make our way back to the ambush site. And it's dangerous moving at night in the dark because you could get shot up by anybody. So um, we get back to the ambush site and I'm thinking to myself like, oh, oh, I forgot to tell you part of this. I took a grease pen that I had for my map and I wrote on the guy's chest. I opened his shirt and I wrote uh, snake bite. I ate 20 ornate. Okay. I put that on his chest. Hopefully, you know, I told him show yeah. that when you get to a doctor. So, so he, he's gone. So now we get back to the ambush site and I'm thinking to myself like, oh man, I mean, like, I'm like exhausted. I, I'm, or, what you else could happen? You know, what else could happen tonight? You know? So now I'm laying there and like a minute seems like, I mean, it seems like an hour, you know, another minute, another minute, a moment. Then around, I, I guess it was around 1 30, in the morning. All of a sudden I hear little clinking of things. Something's, there's metal against metal and it's, it's soldiers. And when we knew it was going to be enemy soldiers and they, it was poor noise discipline on our part. They didn't have their equipment all tied down and they were making little noises, little things. We heard them coming. We heard them coming. So now I'm like, Oh man. Uh -huh. you know, so this is real. John like le leans there. He's right next to me. Okay. John leans over and because I had my M16 and we're laying down in a prone position. I brought my M16 up, you know, and he like put his hand on top of my, up over up by my sights, you know, and he, and he whispered real low, I initiate contact. Okay. And what do you say? I initiate yeah, the right, contact. Right. I was like, 
okay. <laughs> Sarge. This sergeant does it. <laughs> I understand. I follow orders well. Yeah. So um, the, the clanging kept getting closer and closer. Now I could tell it was right below us. And John, we had a Claymore mine set up at either end. And John just, pop, 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 he hits the clacker and boom, boom, boom. These Claymore mines go off. And I mean, then certain guys that were on ambush, they, their job was to immediately fire off handheld flares so we could see. And these flares are, they're going up. And now I hear John on the, uh, talking back to our camp. We're in contact, you know, give me illumination and give me HE at these pla- high explosives at these, pl- this, pl- these places. And I mean, and then John's you know, like yelling at me, shoot, man, shoot. You know, so now I'm like, now, oh, I, now, I, now, now, I'm good, now, now I'm good. Now I'm good. Yeah. So yeah. I'm like shooting. Laying and, lead down. And, and these guys, of course, they're running for their lives. You know, they didn't know which way they're to go. And um, I mean, it, you know, it it ended as quickly as it started. And I know we kept fly, firing up those flares and I was like, man, well, I'd say it was all over. I, I, I'm trying to again think, well, m- maybe say it started whatever it didn't last all that long but it was over but it was only like still two o'clock in the morning definitely, like, definitely now i was my eyeballs were rigged i was like what else is gonna happen here you know there was there was no like worry about i'm gonna fall asleep right. you know I'm, I'm wide awake when after not to cut you off on that but after something like that happened you do like a little roll call to make sure everybody's good well, how does it, how well, do you communicate that well that john was teaching me that's that's what we did now so now we're gonna make sure we're quietly he's going to go yeah, that's the thing. make sure everyone on the line checks in with him that we're okay we have no wounded no ki- you know, killed in action we're, we're all good and then now there was in this instance we did not do an immediate sweep of, of where we had just shot him up and so we waited till daybreak and then we just got online now there was there wasn't that many of us i'd say there were maybe 12 of us total okay. you know two americans 10 of them 10 mercenaries. So we swept the area. And I mean, there were, there was a good body count. There was equipment all over the place. So we'd hit them really, really hard. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. So now obviously you, you did your tour. I'm sure you had tons of, you know, experiences like that. Very similar. Let's go, let's move it into a little bit later okay. in your military. And then now let's kind of push it off and, and, okay get into the secret service. So, so now, you know, again, eventually now I had enough experience that our team sergeant, I would be the senior guy and I'd be taken out of a more junior guy. And what I learned is I had good instincts and I, I just had an ability that I kind of tell when something's not right here or something's okay. And then when we were in contact, I had a good idea of how we needed to to, uh, respond and, you know, calling in air support and how we were going to maneuver and everything. And I was decent at it. So I realized I had good instincts, instincts that I could trust in a, in a critical, you know, life threatening situation. Lou's way of saying it. I'm decent at it. He's very good (laughs) at it. Right. Lou's super humble in that. So, so now my tour is over and I go home and literally, th- this was like, one day you're in Vietnam, and then you get on an airplane, and like 20 hours later, I land at Fort Lewis, Washington, and I was being discharged. So that, you, that night, that I... Culture shock. Oh, totally culture shock. And I could not believe, I could not fathom in my mind that there was not a war here. There had, I kept thinking, it's got to be in the mountains. They got to be in the mountains. Somewhere. So, you know, I fly home and i'm now i'm at my home with my parents seeing my girlfriend you know sleeping in my bed it was surreal but it, it's an adjustment it, it's a it's it's a lot to adjust to yeah and in a lot of ways my mind was still in the special forces mode yeah how did you how did you real touch on that real quick how did you adjust how were you able to unwind it have you ever really ever been able to fully do that or i, I don't think i've ever fully done it because I'm always looking, waiting to see if something's going to happen. And then I, I will tell you, I think, you know, well, what I did was when I started college, I, I took three months off. Then it was the fall. I started college at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. And um, 
I, I throughout my time there at school, I knew that I had these instincts and I just kept thinking to myself, what employer would, would be looking for these instincts? You know, I mean, I knew I wasn't going to go out on ambush, you know, and shoot them up in America or anything, but somewhere these instincts could be of value. And that's when I thought, you know what, at some point, Secret Service could really use it. This is good stuff that I did. It was a test and the Secret Service will be, they'll appreciate these instincts. So I graduate and um, I'll, I, I could talk all day about this, but I said, so I'll cut it a little short. Sure. I just, I apply for the Secret Service. I get accepted and I was living in Pittsburgh. I, I was assigned to the Philadelphia field office and I was, I traveled there and that's where I began my career. Yeah, amazing. And then you you Philadelphia, what were what were your duties in Philadelphia and how did you get put in the position that you later became the 22nd PPD okay. Presidential Protection Division. So which is amazing to me. So we'll I mean, now that. this is this is not the military. Well, you know, <laughs> this is law enforcement right. and it, it's different, okay? Yeah. So um I had to learn the law. How do you enforce the law? So, and how do you become a law enforcement officer? So they, there's a treasury school. Secret Service was then under the treasury department. It's now under Homeland Security. So I went to, um, my recollection, it was like either two or three months of treasury law enforcement school. And they teach you very basics, you know, Miranda, probable cause, arrest, how you make an arrest, all that. So then when I completed that, went back to my field office and within, I don't know, within a couple of weeks, I was sent back down to Washington, D.C. for, and again, I think it was three months of Secret Service school. And they teach you things that are directly related to the Secret Service. So um, the, the Secret Service is probably best known for its protection of the president, vice president, and uh, foreign heads of state that are visiting the country. But they also, they were founded in 1865 they were founded as an investigative agency because one third of the currency in circulation in our country was counterfeit. So they were formed to be a federal investigative agency and counterfeiting was their primary uh, objective. So, um, but when you're a new agent, there's a lot to counterfeiting cases, especially back in the seventies and eighties and nineties when I was an investigator. Um, they started you small, small steps. So there were treasury checks and treasury checks were mailed out in the regular mail. There was no email. There was no Twitter, none of that stuff. Okay. This was regular mail in the mailbox. So people would get a treasury check and there was theft of the checks and people would forge them and cash them and everything. So we were assigned to, to uh, investigate forged treasury checks. And that's how you, it's a, it, you, you're, it's not that involved of an investigation, but it gives you experience in how to, you know, investigate, how to make an arrest. Yeah, I now have probable cause. I can make an arrest. Now I'm going to take them through the process. Yeah, put a case together. Put a case together. A, a to Z, yeah. it, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to put the cuffs on somebody. I'm taking them to court and go to the trial, all that. So I, I did fairly well. And I'd say within about maybe within two and a half years, I was put over to the counterfeit squad, which is counterfeiting back in the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. It was an organized crime activity. Now it's really, you do it on a, a computer. So back, but back then you needed plates, you needed a printer, you needed a distribution uh, you know, uh, s system. So it was organized crime that was doing it. So we were up against organized crime. So I did that in Philly. I, I, I was in Philadelphia, Philadelphia for five years. Then I was transferred to New York City, which is, that's a, that's a wild place a, to go. Okay. And, and in fact, our offices were in the World Trade Center, but that place, I mean, you could work counterfeit there 24 hours a day. You're not going to put a dent in it. You get exposed to everything. It's, oh my goodness. It is, it's like the, the, you know, Serpico, you're just kicking in doors and everything. It was wild and woolly, okay? And I, so I was there doing that. And then, um, you know, one day, I'm, I happened to be in the office, I, I recall this, and someone runs up to me and says, President Reagan was just shot. 
And we were like, what? You know, and people were putting TVs on and everything. And he, he had been shot. He, now people may not remember this, but he was only in his 69th day in office. So he was a very new president. He'd been shot um, as well as several other people there, Secret Service agent, and a good friend of mine, Tim McCarthy. He was shot, uh, Officer Delahanty, and then um, the James uh, Brady, James Brady, the White House press secretary. So, and of course, President Reagan. So Reagan's rushed to the hospital. And when he was shot, that he was shot by John Hinckley, shot six rounds in less than two seconds. One of he was a 22 <clears throat> revolver. One of the rounds hit the armored limousine and it flattened to, to be like the size of a dime. And it ran right along the 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 door, the, the uh, body of the car. And the door was open, so there was a the door on this limo opened backwards. So there was a seam where the president was being pushed into the limousine, and he had his arms up because he was it was just a natural reaction. His arms right. went up as he was being pushed in, and the round hit him in his armpit and went right up to his heart. So the agent in charge then um, he 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 did a great job. His name was Jerry Parr. He realized right away he saw foamy blood on the president's mouth. He said, don't go to the White House. Take us to, to the hospital. Straight, right. Straight to the hospital. So they get to the hospital, and the president said, I'm walking in. I'm not going to be taken in on a gurney. And, and Jerry said to him, well, sir, he says, I'm walking in. So they take maybe two steps, and the president goes down. Really? Jer Jerry grabs him. And, and on the other side of Jerry was another guy that doesn't ever – I don't think he really got enough credit for everything because he wasn't – the agent in charge. His name was Ray Shattuck. He was on the other side of the president. He was one of the, on one side also pushing in the president. And then he was there when he went down at the hospital. And so they get him on a gurney. Now they get him in and he was really bleeding, he, internal bleeding tremendously. And the way that bullet was, because it was like a dime. Now the surgeons couldn't see it on the x-rays. <clears throat> Finally, they did catch a glimpse of it and they were able to get it and tie off the bleeders and they saved his life. Um, yeah, I don't think people really realized the, it, the danger and how near he, death was. He, almost, he was very close to death. Very close. So, and I mean, he was Time, very lucky. Timing, crucial. Every, every little thing was. Every little thing. If he had been taken to the White House, probably would have died. Now, let me ask you about the, the limo. When, when he left in that limo, was it just like mash the gas and go? Totally. And, Probably so, running. <laughs> there, there was no lead car. There was no longer a motorcade. Nope. There was there was the literally limousine, limousine. And the follow up, and, and then some other cars just kind of jumped in behind. I think the police were behind. Oh, the, and the, the local PD did a great job. They always do. Right. right. Without the local PD, the Secret Service is nothing. And I'm not talking about just in Washington D.C. I'm talking about everywhere. The support that they give us, just just amazing. Can't yeah. can't thank local law enforcement enough. So now. Um, now he's recouping and, and I'm in New York. So <clears throat> the first lady met with the director of the secret service and said, Hey, you know, my son, my husband gets shot the 69th day. day 69. Yeah. And you know, what are we going to do different? So the director says, we're going to increase vastly the number of people on the president's detail. We're going to, we're going to create a counter assault team and uh, a team that will, not be uh, engaged with evacuating the president, but their sole mission is they're going to engage the, either the, the shooter, the terrorist, or a terrorist cell with a high volume of automatic weapons fire and eliminate them. So um, the, the changes began, and I was one of the people that got transferred from New York onto the, uh, down to Washington, D.C. in the protective operations. And my first assignment was with a counter-assault team. So I went through additional marksmanship training and uh we did see what's called cqb uh, uh close, close quarters, quarters battle yeah you, you know a little that. bit of that stuff. yeah you, you yeah. back yeah, in you the know day that too. exactly me back in the day too <laughs> back in the day so we did all that then so i was on the, the cat team for about two years then i get transferred to president reagan's uh detail so i was a shift agent there yeah so fill me in on that first day when you actually get to protect the president that's what i want to hear it, you know Tim, I'd been in the Secret Service at this point about 10 years, and this was like a brand new job. I mean, now I've yeah. been through Secret Service school, but that's very basic. Plus, it's 10 years ago. 
So I'm like, this is a new job. I don't know what to do. But the guys on on the president's detail, the PPD guys, they know you don't know what to do. So you you're assigned to a shift. And my shift leader said, like, I like I'm standing there and you know, I met him. His name was Brian Stafford. And um, he said, look, just just do what I tell you to do. We know you don't know anything. Just just watch us for like, you know, a couple of weeks and then we'll give you a tiny little something to do. So that that's again, the teaching begins. And, you know, I was really fortunate. I was with a great bunch of guys. What's what? We're going to do a presentation and kind of giving a little secret. We're going to, you're going to do a presentation yes. for, for my, for me. And we're going to invite some special guests to come and we're going to see tons of pictures. It's amazing. You guys have to see this. There's a white but, house photo. Yeah. Well, white, white house, house yeah. photos. We're going to yeah. see this special presentation. Yeah. Lou's going to do for, for me. Um, what, what's it like though? When you're like, you're, you're standing there and you have the first, cause I know, I know when you, when you run into bump into people that are, are kind of high profile around town, you're like, Hey, I, should I say something? Should I, what's the rule on that? Are you allowed? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so funny. You bring that up to me. Like a, a friend of mine that was from the Philadelphia office <clears throat> and he had been in protection for about two years now. I saw him there. His name was Chris Algieri. I say, Chris, what, what's it like? And he goes, well, for you and for all new guys, when you first walk near the president, like when you're walking with him, it's like you have concrete blocks on your feet. You can't even walk. It's just like, yeah, what am I doing? And like, as far as talking to him, you're, you're not going to say anything to him. <laughs> but at some point, the president will engage you in conversation. And he said, just remember, just refer to Mr. President. And you'll probably say something real stupid and he'll laugh at you, you know, because he knows you're a new guy. And he understands the pressure you're under. And he said, and it was President Reagan. He was great. He was, he was a wonderful, wonderful man. Yeah, tell me just what was a, one little snippet of a conversation that you had? Or, Well, I, I mean, what I recall is, you know, we worked. There were three shifts, so we covered 24 hours a day. So there was a midnight shift, and, you know, an 8 to 4 shift, a midnight shift, a 4 to 8 shift. So on the midnight shift, when he would be taking him, uh, you know, you, you'd leave the Oval Office, go down to Colonnade, get in the elevator, and you'd go upstairs to the residence. He would typically, he would say, like, gather around, boys. I got a little story to tell you. And he'd want to tell you a joke. And his jokes were great. I mean, he was just, he was like a grandfather figure that you really, just, you know, like so I know some people would say, well, how could you, you know, be willing to jump in front of a bullet? This guy you would do it in a heartbeat just because out of sheer love for him. You, you just admire the man. You had total respect for the man. I'd be, I would do this. No question. And, and I don't know if you can tell me, but what, what's it like, like the movement, like when they're ready to go to bed or they, you know, they kind of go to their place and you guys keep an eye on the outside. Yeah. Type well, of yeah. Thing. When he gets, present. I mean, if he's going to be in public, we're on his shoulders. Okay. Now when he goes to the residence, when he gets up, you take him up in the elevator there, there's a residence. So there's, there's doors that lead to the residence. There's a door, two doors. So there's an agent in front of each door. One's like the, at one end of the building, one's at the other end of the building. And so we're just monitoring. So once he's into the residence, he, he they can do whatever they want to do. They have a small kitchen there. Of course they have butlers that do all the cooking for them and everything. But if they decided, you know, if, if uh, Mrs. Reagan decided I want to cook dinner tonight, she could, um, so they had a life, you know, beyond those doors. We were not, they had a personal life, right. but they also came to realize that we were there strictly for protection. We're not like looking at what are they doing and we're going to report them, not taking notes on you. That's not our job. You know, we were to be there strictly for, for protection and they could live their lives the way they wanted. Yeah. I was wondering how that balance works. Obviously, <clears throat> people ask you questions and now you, you know, you're again, retired, but you can talk a little bit about it. But when you're there, does that pressure from the outside come a little bit or people ask you, or they're just kind of more curious. Cause I think it's like one of the coolest jobs ever you can imagine. I mean, people always want to know about it, but, and I, I could talk about things like, like him telling the stories and everything, but I would never discuss anything I saw that took place between, president reagan and mrs reagan or with one of their family members 
or with one of their staff people. That was that's strictly business, and and it's going to stay confidential. I'll I'll never talk about it. I'm, I'm, it's not my job. Now, well, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, <laughs> that's that's perfect. You obviously progressed. You had on the PPD for uh, Reagan and George Bush and Bill Clinton, correct? And then you became the basically the commander, if you yeah. will, the the SAC for that, right? For the, for the SAC, PBD, yeah. right? Which is the special agent in charge. Correct. So I was a shift agent. I started as a regular shift agent. One of, you know, on my shift was 30, 35 people. Then about two years in, and a lot of this was because of this, what I brought. I brought a lot of my special forces background there and was applying it. And the bosses could see, whoa, that, that, that group's working really well. So there was a, a an opening for a shift leader and I put in for it and that's, it's a GS 14 position for those that understand the GS level. And I got it. So now I had my own shift and now I was really able to apply my philosophies. We're going to do it this way, this way. And I, I was changing things, not, not drastically, but I was making changes that were, I felt were good. My shift agents really liked the changes. And then actually the sack, everybody liked the leadership, change. leadership. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, then I was, I was a shift leader for about two years and then an opening came up as an ASAC assistant special agent in charge. And I applied and I got it. And that it's really to be promoted once on PPD is a big deal to be promoted there twice is it's very rare. Okay. So now I was an ASAC and um, I was an ASAC at the end of, Reagan's administration, and then I was an ASAC on President Bush administration. So assistant, <clears throat> assistant agent, special agent, agent in charge. charge yeah. yeah, and I, I I was one of so there's the SAC, the deputy SAC, the the D SAC. That's the number two guy. Then there were six ASACs, then the shift leaders, and then all the working agents. So then I moved on at one point to become the D SAC, the number two guy, and then and this was with Clinton. And then I became the SAC and I was the 22nd person in the history of the secret service to hold that position. Wow. And that was, that was, and that was under Bill Clinton. Correct. When you became the D SAC. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's, that's, that's amazing. That's when you became the SAC. But D SAC and SAC. SAC. So let's talk a little bit about that. So Bill Clinton, we had a discussion saying he was a pretty funny guy. He was a good guy. I mean, he, he really was. I mean, You know, initially when you're with a new president, there's like a real, there's a period of trying, testing, and you know, because you're 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 like with him a lot. Like you're spending now. Now you're not only with him. I mean, you're you're talking to him every day. I mean, this is not like, you know, the president may say something to you. I mean, you're not going to just have conversation. You're going to have very in depth conversations and very substantive conversations about. Like there, maybe there was something the president wants to do and I've sent agents out to look at it and it's like, sir, I'm really sorry. We can't do it. You know, and he, how does like, that go? Well, see, this is where, this is where an agent has, to, you got to have the nerve to do that, to say to a president, I'm sorry, sir, can't do it. You know, or if you want to do it, we're going to change it and you're going to do it my way or we're not doing it. And there's a little, it gets a little touchy because they want to do things, but this is where the ever present conflict is between president and staff interests and secret service interests. You know, you know, there's the security concerns. You have to be able to tell a president no. And I learned that from an American hero named Clint Hill and Clint Hill. If you all recall on November 22nd, 1963 in Dallas, he was the Secret Service agent that jumped off of the follow-up car in the midst of the shooting and made it to the follow-up car, pushed Mrs. Kennedy back into the limo, jumped in. I mean, you know, if he hadn't made that, I mean, those cars were accelerating. He's not in track shoes. He's in dress shoes, okay? And people are shooting at him. He knows there's shots coming. If he would have slipped, that follow-up car would have run him over, not on purpose, but the car was was bearing down right on, on behind him. I mean, it wasn't Clinton like couldn't go to the side. He was he is trying to get onto the 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 uh, handles to grab himself up, pull himself onto the back of the limo. So Clint, after this happened, 
I want to be delicate about how I talk about this. You know, he became the agent in charge of Johnson's detail. Of course, you know, obviously Kennedy died. Right. Okay, so, you know, the, everyone on that detail had psychological issues they had to deal with. Okay. I've had others <clears throat> that were on that detail tell me it ruined their life. And I know Clint suffered from it all. And at one point, Clint um, was promoted, but it was time for him to leave the president's detail. And he was advised, you, you have to retire. And there's, there's, um, there's, it wasn't medical reasons. It was psychological reasons. Okay. So, and it was guilt is what it was. It was right. guilt. Okay. So he left the secret service you know, he retired completely, left the secret service and he, he blamed himself. In fact, there's a, an interview, you can go online and find it, I'm trying to think of the re reporter that he, he interviewed with, uh, Tom, it may have been Tom Brokaw. And he's sitting there on the couch and Brokaw says, you know, you were a hero. And, and, and Clint says, you could take all those things I was awarded. I don't deserve them. I didn't do my job that day. And they said, yeah, you did do a job. And he says, no, I'm to blame for the death of the president. And the Brokaw says, no, no, you're not. And, and Clint just keeps shaking his head. And, and so, but anyways, Clint stayed away from the secret service for years and it destroyed his family life. It destroyed him. And then when I was the DSEC with Clinton, one of the assistant directors contacted Clint and said, we want you to come back to the Secret Service. We want you to see that you're our hero. What you did is something we study. Every agent studies this constantly. Every agent on PPD constantly studies what you did. And well, they're hoping someday they could do what you did. So he agreed to come back. So we met him in, in our conference room. It was, it was probably, I know it was the SAC. I was the DSAC. And probably just the ASACs. So there's eight or nine people in there. And Clint came in and he told us, and I'll never forget. In fact, I get choked up sometimes when I talk about it. I hope I can get through it now. He said um, to us, he said, don't ever let a president tell you what to do. He said, because what happened there that day, we were ordered off of the limousine by the president. We were ordered to take that roof off of the car by the president. And he said, and that's what we did. And he said, you, they, the president doesn't understand security. Secret Service understands security. He said, don't ever let this happen again. Do you understand that? And he, he looked at us and he said, every night that my pillow, my head touches the pillow, the demons come back. And he said, I, I'm going to live with that for the rest of my life. So you all that are sitting here, don't you let that ever happen to anyone again. And I took that to heart. So, I mean, when, when, when any, when either president Reagan, Reagan was very easy to deal with, but he'd been shot. Okay. Yeah, yeah, now yeah. we were, when we went with president Bush, you know, president Bush was, he was director of the CIA. He is a Navy aviator at 18 years old. He got shot down in world war II. He was a tough guy. Yeah. Okay. He didn't necessarily like that the secret service was going to tell him anything. So quite often they would say, Lou, you, you tell them. <laughs> so yeah, you, 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 do, it. you, you do it. Yeah. You, you Mr. Do president, it. So, <laughs> Mr. President, this is not happening. To me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which you think you want to go do, tell him. Yeah, yeah. Go tell him that what he wants to do is not going to happen. There. So, so by the time I got to president Clinton and now I'm listening to Clint Hill's words or advice, I knew, Hey, I am doing the right thing and I'm not going to falter. I'm going to do this. So I was very forthright with president Clinton and tell him this is the way we do production and surrogate. I do recall telling him all the men and women on this detail, we'll give our lives for you. We'll give our lives for Mrs. Clinton and we'll give our lives for Chelsea. But I don't want any of my people killed or injured needlessly because if someone on your staff tells the secret service, you can't do that. We're not, we're going to, we will negotiate things, but we're going to do it in a secure fashion. And I'll tell you something, he took it to heart and, and he told, he said, I want you to do it the right way. And, and he did. And there, we did have times when we clashed, 
but it was very professional. And um, after it was over, he would, he would call me aside and he said, you know what? You were right. It wasn't that bad. We, we did it your way. You know, and I wasn't trying to be, uh, it wasn't like disrespect. Was it was for his safety. Totally. It was, yeah, it was yeah, totally yeah. for his safety. Yeah. And, and I know we're going to, uh, hopefully we'll have a couple seconds to talk about what happened in the Philippines. If you can do that one. And yeah. then, and then uh, the trips on air force one and just, you know, how, just explain to us how that works. Like how you load in and then do you ever get a chance to go back? Do you ever see the presidents? Do they oh, go back and sleep? Yeah. Or, I mean, what are you guys doing on the air force one? Um, well, the supervisor seat, so the SAC and the, the next senior guy, typically an A SAC or the D SAC, you're sitting right outside of the, of the president's office. Okay. And the, the rest of the secret service are about midway back in the plane. Okay. So, I mean, you're not only just seeing them, you're talking to them constantly. I mean, it's, it's a constant. And in fact, they were you're talking about, to the president. It's a constant. I mean, just, you know, he'd come out of here. Hey, how much longer we got? You know, okay, sir, what's what we're going to do? And by the way, sir, when we do get there, I want you to do this. And okay, okay, just, it's just, at this point, it, it has was, to be. It, it just has to be. Yeah. And you know what? If you can't do that, you can't be the SAC or the D SAC. You can't, you got to be able to talk to the guy. But um, I mean, Air Force One, it, it's a 747, the current one. And, you know, a typical 747 has maybe, I, I don't know what, 250, 300 seats in it. Okay. Air Force One has, I believe the number is 53 seats. That's it. Okay. Because every seat is a large first class seat. And they're like in the front of the plane the, is the president's office. There's a bedroom with a queen size bed. There's a shower. So, I mean, this is what we need. I mean, we're, we're flying overseas. Yeah. You're going to Israel. You're flying for 10, 11 hours. The president's got to be fresh when he comes off. He's got a, he's the leader of the free world. We have an amazing picture of that. And when you guys, that, that one you showed me, we're going to show yeah. it at the yes. presentation. Yeah, the presentation. Yeah. The, the presentation's got a lot of these great. Oh, we got to see this. You guys got to be ready. So, so, I mean, life aboard Air Force One was very nice. And, and I'm going to be honest with you. You get spoiled because now I'm not on Air Force One. <laughs> And like, I'm traveling on United Donald Airlines, Trump Southwestern. I got like, where's my baggage, man? I mean, like, what there's, I'm only, what, I need something to eat, you know? Customs, not, not what's that? Yeah, yeah. Customs. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's a whole different life, but, but it's all, you know, mission oriented and everything. It, it's, it, it's very nice. It's very yeah. comfortable, you know, yeah. but, but it's all mission. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, the Philippines and and okay. after you came in and gave me a little presentation, of course I went back and you know checked up on the the information you gave me and and I was just in shock of you know the situation in Manila, right? The Philippines. Philippines, yeah. Yeah, tell us a little bit about how. I mean, I know you're going to be humble about it, but you're basically credited with saving well, you know President. Well, Clinton's I mean, life. let me tell the story. I mean, just, I don't want to say I saved his life. I mean, I don't know what would have happened. Right. I know, I know a bomb would have gone off, you know? Um, so now this is when the, when I'm the sack, okay. The agent in charge and I would receive daily briefings and those briefings are from the secret service has its own intelligence division, but they're not, they don't um, gather intelligence. They receive intelligence from the other intelligence agencies, all other intelligence agencies, are tasked to, pr to provide the Secret Service with anything that is, is threatening the president or if the president's going to go to a certain place and they have intelligence on it, they're, they mandated they must pass that to the Secret Service. So the intelligence briefer would come in from the Secret Service and brief me on everything. This is what's going on today in Washington, D.C. But then they'd say, you know, next week you're going to travel to Chicago. This is what's going on in Chicago. Then you know, three weeks from now, you're going to Manila. This is what's going on in Manila. So in one of those briefings about Manila, the briefer told me there's a group in Manila that the Filipinos are concerned about. And the, we're, we now, they're on our radar screen, but the Filipinos are telling us they have them in check. Well, I'm not talking just about the Filipinos. Anytime I ever heard anyone tell me they're in check, they're in check the red flag goes up <laughs> the hairs on the back of my neck stand up because i know they're not in check i mean <laughs> they may think they're in check they may want them to green be in check. beret they're, experience they're, they're, yeah the instincts <laughs> they're not in check okay 
So every day I'd ask about that group. And every day the answer was the same. There's nothing further to report. So I filed that in the back of my mind. Okay. Now uh, the trip began, we went to Australia. So we're in Australia, we're out on the Great Barrier Reef and everything. And that was more like a, that was more like a presidential. I mean, it was an official visit and he was meeting with heads of state, but he had opportunity to relax there. So now we're there several days. We get on Air Force One and we're headed to Manila. Okay. So now on each, so there's, there's a, from the Secret Service Intelligence Division, there's an agent assigned for intelligence in Manila. Actually, there were two in Manila we, we sent and there was one in Australia. So when I'm getting on the plane in Australia, I grabbed the intelligence agent and I said, brief me real quick as, you know, as you, uh, everything that's going on in Manila. Because I knew now that that place is a little hotbed, okay? So he, he briefs me, but he tells me, look, the agent in Manila, who, and his name was Greg Glaude, G-L-O-D, great guy. And I have full faith in him. He said, Greg's going to probably want to call you on Air Force One. I said, yeah, tell him to do that, please. So we take off and Greg calls me and he says, hey, um, I know you've been getting all the briefings and everything, but he said, but it's, it's getting dicey down here. He said, uh, you know, we're starting to pick up some other stuff going on here and everything. So I said, well, look, I think the flight was four or five hours. I said, call me at least once more before we land. So Greg calls me again. I, I maybe it was, I don't know, less than an hour out. And he said, I'm getting more worried. And I knew Greg had good instincts too. Now Greg telling me that my instincts are really ratcheting up. Now as we're, we land, okay, and we receive information. There was a, an intercept, okay, and the intercept said, there's a wedding across the bridge. So I said to the guy that passed it to me, because this was on the radio, he gave it to me. I said, what does that mean? And he said, we were hoping you could tell us what it means. And I was like, I, I don't know what that means, but anything else you get, please pass it to me. So now we're like, we're on final approach. Okay. So I, my mind's racing now and I have the security survey. It's a, it's a written document, a thick document that the lead advance agent has to send to the SAC prior to our visit, you know, actually like a day before the visit. And I've been, I was reading it on air force one and I was looking, okay, well, what's our first motorcade going to be? And I knew we were going to cross a bridge. So now I'm like wedding across the bridge. Then I thought, I thought, but I wasn't, I would not have bet everything on it, but I thought I recalled several years earlier that I read an intelligence report and a terrorist had used the word wedding to mean an assassination. So now I'm like wedding, assassination, bridge, we're crossing a bridge. This is not good. You know, this is not good. So now we, we land and it's late and they want to go to bed. They're tired. But we're we at the we're going to be at the greeting ceremony um, in Manila. So, so now um, we land. I get Greg and the lead advance guy, and there's there's debate about what way we're going to go because the Filipinos want us to go the primary route, which has been painted. It's with all these billboards welcoming the president, and you know it's it's flowers everywhere. It's beautiful and everything. They have cameras set up, so. Uh, the alternate route <laughs> was through the bad part of town. Okay. So I make the decision right there, alternate route. And yeah. it adds an additional 25 minutes to the trip. So um, the transportation guy, um, I want to try to think of his name real quick because he did a fantastic job. I'll think of it in a minute. So uh, he's now tasked, move all the security from the primary route to the alternate route. That's a big job because we need intersection control everywhere. So he's saying to me, please try to stall the president. I need time. So we're, we're, we're delaying. Finally, it's time. He says, we got it done as best we can. We're ready to go. So we go. And it was a, it was not a very pretty route. It was pretty seedy. Okay. At best. And you, and you said you were like kind of like running behind schedule a little bit. Oh, we were way behind schedule. We were way behind schedule. It's like the president. So, and, and I mean, 
they they want it. Did he give you a little flack about going the other route or not really? Yeah. 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 A little bit. Yeah. But it was like but you're the boss. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, it was, uh, He's, you're the president. Hey, but I'm the boss. The drivers <laughs> of the car, they report to me. Yes, right. yeah, they're gonna make the left turn or the right turn. <laughs> they report to me. Yeah. So so we get to the hotel and um Greg uh about an hour later gets a phone call and he said, There's a bomb on the bridge. We discovered a bomb on the bridge. So I said, get get it rendered safe, have components of it shipped back to the United States so we could tell who put that bomb there. I want to know who's trying to assassinate the president. So then I meet with the president, tell him, the chief of staff, uh, the, the uh, national security advisor, would it happen? And they were like, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I'd like to cut the trip short as, as much as we can, but needless to say, you know, we have to be very careful now. So we're going to, I'm going to do some extra security precautions. They were like, whatever you want to do, do it. So, and they were like, thank you for changing the motorcade. <laughs> thank you. That, yeah, thank thank you. you. That was a good yeah. idea. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't like it at the time, yeah. but it was a good idea. So, um, so now uh, uh, we, we get back to the United States and I wanted, an, I wanted that information. So every day that the briefer would come in, I would ask him, the intelligence bureau, when am I going to get the information? And he'd say, they're working on it, they're working on it. So about three weeks went by, and he said, tomorrow th they're coming in, a different group of people. So the next day, a group of people came in, and um, one of the agents was from the FBI. His name was John O'Neill. And they were from a group called, um, oh, God. I can't think of the name of it now. Alex Station. Alex Station. That was a CIA specific group. And they said to me, um, okay, we have identified the terrorists that ordered that bomb placed on the bridge. Now remember, this is 1996. Okay. So they said that he's a he's a, a new terrorist on the scene. He's got hundreds of millions of dollars. He has a, a an army of people that will fight for him. He he got these people from Afghanistan. And um, his name is Osama bin Laden. And they said to me, have you ever heard of him? And I said, no, I haven't. And they said, wow. well, and this is 1996, five years before 9-11. Wow. So they said, well, you have to, you're going to have to learn as much as you can about him because this guy's out there and we were afraid he may try something else. So, I mean, I tasked, well, they gave us a lot of reading material and I studied it all. I tasked the entire senior staff of PPD to study it. And we came to the conclusion very quickly. Not only is this guy a danger to the president of the United States, this is a guy, he's a danger to the free world. Yeah. yeah. Front runner yeah. terrorism. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. In 1996, the name comes up, Bowen, B route instead of A route. I mean, there's just yeah. a lot of things, yeah. a lot of components yeah. there. And and again, in your presentation, you have a lot of these pictures, a lot of, a lot oh, of yeah, information. I yeah. Um, I can't wait to, you know, present to everybody to see this. It's, 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 it is amazing presentation. One, one last quick question. We'll wrap it up. Cause you know, we've been going, it was been, it's been like an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. So it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Geez. Look at that. So um, it goes by quick and, and, and again, fascinating information and you, and you're just to be commended for, for all the things that you've done. And, and I know you're very humble about it, but just, it's, it's just amazing. Do, do, do you ever have any contact with any of the presidents ever presidents that you've protected ever well at, since obviously you know I, I, george um, bush and i visited Ronald president reagan, reagan when i was the director okay and um but you know he became right, ill and of course right. he passed away and then but president bush and i uh, we would talk on the phone he he was such a great guy he had a real sense of humor too yeah, george he, he, we'll we'll talk about this another time yeah he, i can't wait but president bush he would call me i'd call him and we would talk fairly often Always. I mean, how's that word? Do you like have like a cell phone number for him? No, well, you go typically, through. Typically, well, I do have phone numbers for him, but typically, <laughs> all you have to do is call the White House operator and say, "This is this is this, this is, is Lou. Lou. I yeah, want to talk yeah. to President." That's Bush. pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And then President Clinton, you know, of course, now President Bush passed, and right. I did. I was honored to attend his funeral, to be invited to his funeral. And um, now, President Clinton, if he ever comes to where I am, he'll invite me. If I'm in Naples. Um, if he's coming to a function here, he'll invite me to the function, me and my wife. That's fantastic. And we'll go and, um, you know, he, he's just, he's a really good guy. I yeah. really like him. He's a yeah. good guy. Yeah, yeah. No, that's fantastic. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming on. This welcome. has been great. I mean, we could literally go for four hours and I know, and you're just <laughs> such a 
a great storyteller. You get into it and just some outstanding information. I, I want to thank you so much here, for coming on. I'll tell you something. I enjoyed being here. To me, truly, it's an honor. It's an honor. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're more than welcome. All right. 239 Uncensored, everything Southwest Florida and beyond. And we have the greatest, the greatest guest of all time. Uh, Lou is here. And, and Lou, again, thank you so much. Before we usually go out, we always do a little fist bump in the middle. Thank you, Lou. <laughs> I appreciate it. We are out.